Right now on Morning News Now, smoke rising from the Gaza skyline after a night of heavy bombardment. Israel pushing deeper into the Hamas-run region just hours after agreeing on a daily humanitarian pause to let civilians out. And new developments on talks to release some 240 hostages still being held captive by Hamas. We have team coverage. Also this morning, another shutdown showdown taking shape on Capitol Hill. I wish the, uh, the house would just get to work. The idea we're playing games with a shutdown at this moment is just bizarre. And a big shakeup in the Senate as Democrat Joe Manchin announces he won't run for re-election. We'll bring you the latest. Plus, a high-profile trial now underway for the man accused of attacking the husband of former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. We'll take you to court for opening arguments and the role conspiracy theories and misinformation could play in the case. And summer in October, you heard that right. Last month was officially the hottest October ever recorded. Might just be the tip of a melting iceberg. We'll give you the lowdown on what's bringing temperatures way, way up. Morning, good to have you with us on another busy Friday. I'm Joe Fryer. But at least it is Friday. Exactly. I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to get started this morning with the ongoing violence in Gaza, which continues to come under heavy Israeli bombing. Overnight, Palestinian health officials said that multiple people were killed in Israeli strikes that hit some of Gaza's hospitals. Now, the video shows the aftermath of an attack in the courtyard of the Al Shifa hospital. The IDF has confirmed it's operating near the hospital, but says it did not target civilians and operates in a accordance with international law. The latest bloodshed comes a day after Israel agreed to implement a daily four-hour humanitarian pause in parts of northern Gaza to allow civilians to flee. Speaking in India earlier, Secretary Blinken welcomed the decision but said it was only a first step. Much more needs to be done uh, to protect civilians and uh, to make sure that humanitarian assistance reaches them. Far too many Palestinians have been killed. Far too many have suffered uh, these past weeks, and we want to do everything possible to prevent harm to them and to maximize the assistance that gets to them. To that end, we'll be continuing to discuss with Israel uh, concrete steps that can be taken uh, to uh, advance these objectives. We've got a team standing by covering the latest developments in a moment. We'll speak with our terrorism analyst, Jim Kavanaugh, about the Israeli hostages in Gaza. First, let's kick things off with NBC News correspondent Jay Gray, who joins us from Tel Aviv. So, Jay, let's start off with the situation unfolding at and around Gaza's hospitals. What can you tell us about these strikes and the IDF's ground operation there? Hey, what we know is that Israeli strikes are now uh, pushing deeper into urban areas in Gaza, and the IDF is saying that's where these strikes are taking place. We know that troops as well as equipment moving into those, some of them highly populated areas. We know that tanks and other equipment have surrounded Al-Shifa Hospital, as you talked about earlier, and the IDF continues to believe that that is a main command center for Hamas, though the organization as well as uh, those working in the hospital dispute that, say that. That is not the case. Uh, we know a growing number of people had been living in or around that hospital because they figured it would be safer than their homes uh, over the last 24 hours. That clearly has not been the case. These four hour daily humanitarian pauses in parts of northern yeah. Gaza. How is this going to work? When are they going to start and what has the reaction been like to this? Uh, yeah, we've been told that they've already started today and that they will continue every day, though the timings will be different. Uh, we've seen over the last several days tens of thousands entering those corridors, moving from the north to the south. The U.N., though, is very direct on this and says that a four-hour break is not the answer in Gaza. And there has been continuous bombing, 6,000 bombs every week on the Gaza Strip, on this tiny piece of land where people are trapped and the destruction is massive. There won't be any way back after what Israel is doing to the Gaza Strip. So four hours ceasefire, yes, to let people breathe and to remember what is the sound of life without bombing before starting bombing them again. It's very cynical and cruel. Yeah, the U.N., along with several organizations around the globe, demanding that there be a ceasefire.
And Jay, we're also following the situation in the occupied West Bank. The IDF conducted one of its deadliest raids yesterday. What can you tell us about the situation that's unfolding there and the surge in settler violence that we're seeing there? Yeah, 18 Palestinians killed, at least 20 injured, according to the IDF, and what they are labeling as counterterrorism raids. That's always been a deeply divided and dangerous area. It has intensified since the war began. And Joe Savannah, the UN has recorded 222 settler attacks on Palestinians since uh, the war began, about a month now. And they say that includes burning down olive trees uh, that have been in families for generations, uh, abusing and attacking those who are there to pick the olives from those trees, uh, taking over or destroying Palestinian homes in the region as well. It's an area where the violence is escalating and a big concern, uh, not only here in Israel, but for those watching around the world. All right, Jay Gray, thank you very much for reporting for, for us from Tel Aviv. Let's talk about the negotiations to release those roughly 240 hostages that Hamas is still holding and bring in Jim Kavanaugh for more on this. Jim is an NBC News terrorism analyst and a former ATF special agent in charge. So, Jim, good morning. In a televised address earlier this week, a Hamas spokesperson said the only way to guarantee a full release of the hostages was through a prisoner swap with Israel. Prime Minister Netanyahu has refused that. What do you make of that prisoner swap option? Is this an effective tool at this point in, in what's a war? Yes, of course, it is an effective tool because it has worked before in Israel with Hamas. In fact, the leader of Hamas in Gaza, Sinwar, he was released on a prisoner exchange, uh, you know, with Israel uh, years ago. So, yes, it can work. Uh, you know, you shouldn't take these hard positions when you're, the lives are at stake. Um, when you're dealing with a hostage situation, it's pressure and release of the pressure and more pressure and release of the pressure that will get the other side, you know, to negotiate and talk with you. Uh, so the, the IDF is doing a lot of things right by putting pressure on, but if they're unwilling to release any pressure, it's going to be hard to get hostages out. You know, by the president of Israel just saying, uh, or uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu just saying, release them all or nothing. That's that's not necessarily a good tactic. I think they should soften that a little bit. Uh, look, I'd say they're winning. They've hit uh, Gaza with uh, 14,000 uh, aerial strikes. They've got the IDF in there. They're in the tunnels. They've they've uh, slammed closed more than 130 tunnels. They're hurting Hamas. Hamas's backs against the wall. They're in a great position to continue. And nobody thinks they should stop forever, but they might think about a little release of pressure to get. 10, 20 hostages out, and then resume the battle. So, Jim, talks have been going on this week in Qatar to discuss how a pause in fighting might enable hostages to be released. Uh, do you think going down that route could be a successful way to get them out? Yeah, well, it's the only route open because the Hamas political leadership in Qatar uh, you know, is hosted by the Qatari government there, and our CIA director and the Mossad director from Israel have been there trying to negotiate that. But the communications to Gaza are spotty. I mean, they're in a war zone. The leader there is probably down in a tunnel and can't get communication good all the time. And he's under extreme pressure as well. Uh, and at some point, he may be making his own decisions on, you know, who to release and when to release it to get some relief from the pressure. So from, from one thing I would look at from afar is pressure is not bad. You know, even in police operations, we have to pressure the person holding the hostages with SWAT teams, moving them closer to the buildings, tear gas, pressure, pressure, pressure. That gets you some concession to release, and then you can back the pressure off to get some of the hostages out. So everything the IDF is doing here is not bad. You need pressure or there's no incentive. You need to have them a little bit by the throat for their hearts and minds to follow. So they're doing great things, but when you just say all or nothing, then that's probably not going to work. Uh, I think a one or two day ceasefire uh, to get 20 people out or, or three days to get 20 people out. The IDF can use that for intelligence gathering. Uh, what is what is Hamas doing during those three days? How are they reconstituting their forces? Mm -hmm. What are they moving around? They're listening to them. They're watching them. They can use it as an intelligence uh, bonanza. Also, the hostages will provide mm -hmm. a lot of intelligence because of what they've seen and where they were held. So they ought to reconsider that position. Mm -hmm. All right, Jim Cavanaugh, I appreciate your expertise. Thank you so much.
Now let's go to Capitol Hill, where lawmakers are once again attempting to avoid a government shutdown. The deadline for Congress to pass a spending bill to fund the government and keep it open next Friday, November 17th. And no progress has been made as House Republicans remain divided. The GOP canceled two party line funding bill votes this week in a setback for new House Speaker Mike Johnson. So he's now facing the same challenge his predecessor, Kevin McCarthy, faced just a few months ago. Johnson says he's trying to unite fellow Republicans and pass a spending bill. I believe all Republicans want to get to the same end, and that is to take care of our, uh, our responsibilities. I'm not going to tell you when we'll bring it to the floor, but it will be in time. How about that? Um, uh, trust us. We're working through the process in a way that I think the people will be proud of. NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin joins us with the latest. We're also joined by NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung for more on how the potential impacts a shutdown could have. Good morning to both of you. So, Julie, let's start with you and where things stand right now with a week to go. What are these issues within the Republican Party? How might we avert a government shutdown? That's the big question a week out, and we're in perpetual Groundhog Day here on Capitol Hill. I don't even think Speaker Johnson yet fully knows exactly what plan he wants to go with to temporarily fund the government, but it's all but likely that a short-term government funding measure will be needed because, as you pointed out, the House has not even been able to pass all of their partisan spending bills that, of course, would never become law, let alone agree on something to fund the government for an entire year. The question is, though, how long will a stopgap funding measure go? What will the caveats be? I'm told that the plan that Johnson is most likely leaning toward is this laddered CR, this tiered system, where essentially we will be in a shutdown threat multiple times because the stopgap measure would only fund certain agencies until January, others until February. This is a plan endorsed by some of his most hard right members of his party. Uh, but the Senate has already started work on their own clean CR. That's been led by Majority Leader Chuck Schumer over there, a Democrat, of course. Back over in the House, I asked Hakeem Jeffries, the House Democratic leader, yesterday if a clean CR was a red line for his party. He told me that's the only path forward. Let's bring Brian here on set with us. Um, Brian, so the most recent shutdown was also the longest, five weeks, yeah. 2018 into 2019. Right. What does that tell us about how this could go? Yeah, well, I mean, the stakes are large. When we talk about that shutdown, there were 300,000 federal employees that were furloughed. They weren't paid. And even those that did have to go to work, they weren't getting paychecks. They were back paid after it ended. But uh, in cases like the TSA at the IRS, those are critical services that would remain online. You had some worker no-shows that ended up leading to longer waits at uh, security at many airports. Uh, markets, for what it's worth, didn't really care. They were up 10 percent, although there was $11 billion lost. The Congressional Budget Office estimates $3 billion of that was permanently lost. So if Congress can't come to an agreement, what could happen in the next week? Yeah, well, I mean, Julie was talking about what's the current status, and it doesn't sound like there's going to be a full year uh, continuing resolution there, which means that if that is the case, there was an agreement in the debt limit uh, negotiations earlier in the year that would lead to an automatic 1% cut to discretionary funding, which raises the question, okay, wait, what the heck is discretionary funding? As a reminder, it's not all of federal spending. Most of it, 66 percent, is mandatory things like Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare. That's not what we're talking about here. The 1 percent automatic cuts would be up to that 26 percent of our spending, which is discretionary. And if you unpack what's in there, you'd be looking at things like, for example, uh, um, health, education, veterans, transportation. Uh, whether or not that would come from the non-defense spending, which is 55 5% of discretionary spending or defense spending, 45% is something that is up in the air right now. We don't really know. It depends on how they kind of put together this short-term resolution. Well, Julie, I also do want to ask you what we have, if we could switch gears, Democratic West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin announcing he will not run for re-election next year. Tell us what we know about this decision and then also what that ripple effect looks like in the Senate. Well, he's the only elected Democrat left statewide in West Virginia. So his prospects for re-election in the Senate, he kind of saw the writing on the wall there. They were unlikely. It's very likely that a Republican would actually win that seat. So Manchin doesn't want to lose a race. He's been in the Senate since 2010. He was governor of West Virginia beforehand. Here's what he said yesterday in announcing this. Watch this. I believe in my heart of hearts that I have accomplished what I set out to do for West Virginia. To the West Virginians who have put their trust in me and fought side by side to make our state better, it has been my honor of my life to serve you. Now, we don't expect Manchin to just go away. He even said that he's going to go on a listening tour around the country. One source told me everything was on the table, even when it comes to a third-party presidential run.
All right, Julie Bryan, thank you both. Thank you. Well, with the 2024 election now less than a year away, the safety of election workers is coming back into focus. The FBI is looking into suspicious letters being sent to election workers in several states. As NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian explains, the letters contain an unknown powder, with two of them testing positive for fentanyl. That's right. Law enforcement officials tell NBC News the FBI and the U.S. Postal Inspection Service are investigating a series of letters containing suspicious powder that were sent to election workers and offices in multiple states in recent days. And in at least two cases, the powder tested positive in a field test for fentanyl. Officials say it's now being lab tested. There have been no reports, though, of anyone suffering ill health effects, uh, the officials added. Uh, officials in Georgia, Oregon, Washington State, Texas, and now California have all reported suspicious letters that have been sent to election officers or workers. The FBI, in a statement, said it could not comment on the probe, but urged people to exercise care in handling mail, especially from unrecognized senders. The Texas Department of Public Safety said it had responded to a report of a letter containing an unknown substance that had been mailed to the state attorney general's office in Austin Thursday morning. It said in the statement that preliminary tests on the envelope had come back negative, but that the FBI would do further testing. Law enforcement officials said it's too soon to say where the letters came from or who may be responsible, but election officials are portraying this as domestic terrorism. Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, for example, referred to the envelopes sent to Fulton County as terrorism and said in a statement that his office is working with our state and federal partners to determine if any additional Georgia officials are being targeted. And Washington Secretary of State Steve Hobbs told the Associated Press that the incidents in his state were acts of terrorism to threaten our elections. And of course, these letters are coming at a time when election workers have been the subject of heightened threats and harassment in the wake of baseless claims by former President Trump that the last election was marred by fraud. Back to you. Ken, thank you very much. Court is back in session this morning in San Francisco for the second day of David DePap's federal trial. He's accused of attacking Paul Pelosi, the husband of former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, in their home late last year. DePap has pleaded not guilty. The attack and now this trial are highlighting how conspiracy theories and misinformation online can fuel political violence in this country. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson is following the case. Yeah, packed courthouse today in the federal case against David DePap. DePap, of course, accused of breaking and injuring into the home of then Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. It was something of a, I would call, a legal gambit today from the defense. The prosecution laid out exactly what you would expect. They said they have the evidence to show that DePap struck Nancy Pelosi's husband, that he did it in malice, that he did it because of all these conspiracy theories that were sort of churning in his mind and that he posted online. And in a complete shock, I would say the defense sort of agreed with that. His defense attorney, public defender, uh, essentially said that they agreed that this was a person that was buying into those right wing conspiracy theories, the QAnon, uh, things about people like Tom Hanks and Adam Schiff and Gavin Newsom, and that he would post those and sort of created this ideology that he had to do something, that there was some sort of truth that was being buried. And of course, the primary person was Nancy Pelosi. And in saying that, the defense was saying that that this was different than what was laid out in the federal charges. The charges specifically are talking about preventing a public official from doing her job. So in effect, what he was doing was not that. He was there for an entirely different purpose. Of course, this is a gambit. We'll have to wait and see if it plays out, but we expect to hear a whole lot more testimony. We already heard today from the officers who captured that horrific body cam that I think we've all seen ad nauseum uh, of Paul Pelosi being struck by that hammer. Again, the, def the defense not disputing that it happened. We also do expect to hear from Paul Pelosi himself with testimony scheduled maybe as early as Monday. And if DePap is convicted, he could spend the rest of his life behind bars. Back to you. All right, Steve, thank you so much. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Uh, so there's major evidence, obviously, against DePap in this case. We just heard Steve mention the police body cam footage. So we want to give you a warning because we are going to show that it could be disturbing to some viewers. But prosecutors say he's already admitted to the crimes. What can we expect from a four-day trial here? The tape 
You're going to see Paul Pelosi testify. They have to establish, uh, which I think is going to be pretty easy to do, that he was there and that the assault was committed. But more than that, because we're in federal court and because these charges depend on intent, intent to have something to do with a U.S. official, that would be Nancy Pelosi, they're going to have to lay on that evidence as well, because that's the only reason this case is in federal court. So it's not just about the assault. It's about the intent and the intent to do something to a U.S. official. Walk us through the defense here, this idea that it was not driven by Nancy Pelosi's official duties as a member of Congress, even mattering, especially I think when a lot of viewers see, you know, we have that video of what's happening. What do you make of this defense strategy? Yeah, you could call it a gambit. I mean, I see it differently. I see it as what else are you going to do? Right. I mean, you've got body cam video showing the defendant there. You're not going to argue Sodi, as we call it. Some other dude did it. There's no alibi. He's there. This is what happened. So. Now, as a defense attorney, you sit back and say, here's the stuff we can dispute. Here's the stuff we have no prayer of disputing. So what we're going to dispute is his intent. It's our best and only shot that the intent, and they're threading a needle, even though there are plenty of statements about Pelosi that are going to come into evidence that he didn't have the requisite intent for these particular federal statutes. So Paul Pelosi will likely testify next week. What can we expect from that? Obviously, he's the victim. He's going to testify about what happened to him. But more than that, he's going to testify about the statements that the defendant made to him. Those are critical because those go to the necessary intent for the two crimes that he's charged with. This is not run-of-the-mill assault, burglary. That's going to be in another courtroom, in a state courtroom. We're in federal court. And to get into federal court, you have to have a federal nexus. And that nexus is the intent to do something bad to a U.S. official, Nancy Pelosi. So the statements that Paul Pelosi uh, tells the court about are going to be critical, arguably as critical as his testimony about the harm done him. But again, the government's already got that on video. As some other dude did it. Is that -D -D -I. technical term? <laughs> I, love, yeah. wow. I love when you teach us things. Very quickly, <laughs> how much impact do you think that the federal trial has on the state one? Uh, little, I mean, except that if he's convicted here, it's a pretty good indicator that he's going to go down in the state court case because they have an even lesser burden of proof there. They don't need to prove that he intended to do anything as to Nancy Pelosi. And all they need is that body cam footage, maybe a little testimony from Paul Pelosi. Uh, if I'm the defense in the state court case, I talk about a plea as soon as I possibly can. All right, Danny Savalas, we appreciate you. Thank you. Arizona has been at the center of some of the most divisive and contentious election battles over the last few years. It's not just the results that are under attack, it's election officials, too. And the head election official in Arizona's largest county is working to change that. NBC News correspondent Noah Pransky takes us there. It was a long election month in Arizona 2020. Our call on Arizona is too early to call. The crowd continues to grow. You could be in recount territory in Arizona. We don't feel safe in our work because of the harassment and threats that are based in lies. And for the officials like Stephen Richer at the center of it all, there hasn't been much sleep in the three years since. I am a Diet Coke addict. I am a living walking experiment and i probably drink you know north of 100 ounces every single day um, all right that's a lot and, yeah. and so election week you're you're pounding 50 to 60 <laughs> diet uh yeah, yeah, yeah fueled by a youthful exuberance for due process and lots of caffeine richer may be the most important election official in the country's most important swing state this is our ballot tabulation room the brain center if you will, <laughs> the brain center. Elected county recorder in 2020 in Maricopa County, by far Arizona's largest, Richard's official job is to conduct elections, but unofficially, it's to preserve trust in them. We have these cameras. We hope that they inspire confidence. We hope that they give people an insight into the process. Because since the day he took office in January 2021, this old school Republican has spent every waking, caffeinated hour swatting down some of the most outlandish conspiracy theories one could possibly dream of and working to prevent the next ones. Lots of new cages, it's not connected to the internet, that it's not connected to anything external, since the USB ports are not accessible there. More and more cameras every single year. In many ways, Arizona is this perfect storm for election chaos. Like most Western states, almost all of its voters choose to cast ballots by mail. A huge number of them don't return those ballots until Election Day, and officials by law are not even permitted to touch the ballots until after polls close. Add in remarkably narrow election margins in this notoriously purple swing state, and you get elections that are predictably 
too close to predict within the first couple of days. Seeing the distrust that breeds, Richard's calling for change. I would just like to sort of reconfigure the system such that we're able to have a higher percentage within the first 24 hours. Because you think it'll pay dividends in terms of confidence? Correct. He outlined a series of proposals earlier this year that he says will produce faster election results in Arizona and beyond. They range from what some would say are common sense, like changing state laws so election officials can process mail ballots as soon as they're received, to controversial, like ending the popular option of dropping your mail ballot off in person on election day. I would say that you have to have your early ballots back to us by Saturday before Election Day Tuesday. That would allow us to have a much higher percentage of results immediately available at 8 p.m. on election night. Richer has also floated spending less time trying to determine intent on ballots where the voters make innocent mistakes, like filling in multiple ovals or leaving a coffee stain. He admits these changes could disqualify tens of thousands of votes in a presidential year. My real goal here is let's at least have a conversation. A conversation about what sacrifices are worth it for faster results. Or if it would just be better to slow the rest of the country down to Arizona's speed. I've even floated an idea of a moratorium that nobody releases results until, you know, maybe five days after Election Day because a lot of states have a lot of different policies. Were your proposals intentionally provocative as a way to <laughs> educate the public about how your office works? I am flattered if you think ballot adjudication changes is a provocative, saucy topic. They were meant to illustrate some of the some of the things that go on. So even though his proposals went nowhere this year in the Arizona legislature, making it very likely the 2024 election will also take days to sort out, at least more of his constituents will know why. So have we won? I am not ready to stand on an aircraft carrier and have mission accomplished behind me, but mission, we're working really hard on the mission still. Noah Pransky, NBC News. Much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, a series of close calls prompting a new warning about air travel. What officials want you to know before your next flight. At first, though, a major legal loss for actor Robert De Niro's production company, the latest in a high-profile discrimination lawsuit after the break. Rain returns to the forecast for the South today. Coming up, we'll tell you how long it'll stick around and who else could see rain and potentially some snow this weekend. Welcome back. A New York jury has found Robert De Niro's production company liable for gender discrimination and retaliation. Canal Productions, it's called, has been ordered to pay De Niro's longtime personal assistant, Graham Chase Robinson, more than $1.2 million in damages. The jury found De Niro himself was not liable. Robinson alleged that De Niro gave her, quote, stereotypical female job responsibilities, even though she had been promoted to vice president of production and finance. Some of those jobs allegedly included changing his bed sheets and setting up his new townhouse. Now to some international headlines starting in Sudan's Darfur region where hundreds of people have been killed as a civil war there escalates. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter joins us from our London bureau with the latest on that as well as other international headlines. Hi Molly, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning to both of you. The Joe is right. We are starting in Darfur. It has been a bloody few months, and the escalation continues. Now, this morning, the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, says an approximate 700 people were killed in West Darfur after clashes between the Sudanese Army and paramilitary rapid support forces. We call it the RSF. Now, earlier this week, more than 100 were injured, hundreds more missing. This follows an escalation and fighting between the government's armed forces and the RSF. It has been a brutal few months. Moving to Europe, to Port Portugal, a big announcement yesterday from the Portuguese president. He dissolved parliament and called an early election. The announcement came just two days after the prime minister resigned after a corruption scandal. The new election will be on March 10th. And finally, some good news from our natural world. Scientists have rediscovered a long-lost species of mammal, described as, get this, having the spines of a hedgehog, the snout of an anteater, and the feet of a mole. You really have to see the video to understand what it looks like. It is named for British naturalist David Attenborough. Hasn't been seen for 60 years. A little bit of relief this morning.
Is that flattering, I guess? <laughs> We're naming this animal after you. Do you it looks like be an named anteater. named after a mammal that looks like that. <laughs> exactly. All right. Molly. I think it's an honor whenever a mammal is named after you. I agree. I agree. Thank you, Molly. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Here's a fashion statement for you. Break out your umbrella and maybe even your snow boots. Oh, boy. Angie Lassman has the latest on everything that's in store for your weekend forecast. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Happy Friday. Don't worry. There's some spots where you're going to need the sunglasses, too. We've got plenty of sunshine in the forecast this weekend for some, but we're starting out with that rain across parts of the really s the south stretching up into the mid Atlantic. And this is going to be the region that remains unsettled through the day today. You can see the rain for Alexandria, Memphis, Lexington, Chattanooga in and out of those kind of waves of rain. And really specifically, southern Texas is going to see multiple waves of this kind of heavy rain moving through as we go through the day today and even into tomorrow. Still some of that rain left over as this front kind of just meanders, takes its time moving to the north and east. Um, it'll eventually slide east, but in the meantime, rain through the day today. Looking ahead to your Saturday in this area, still some rain across the southeast, still some rain across parts of Texas. And again, that's where we'll see the heavy rainfall. Not likely we're going to see widespread flooding, but still some localized flooding is a possibility, isolated spots. Um, and with that, we'll see maybe two to three inches for the higher amounts. amounts. And again, no surprise, that's going to also be in portions of southern Texas. Elsewhere, kind of a quarter of an inch to a half an inch and up to an inch of rain across parts of the southeast. Notice uh, southern portions of Georgia and Florida stayed dry, so that'll be nice for folks there. It'll also be warm. Not the case, though, as we look back to Texas. Once again, New Mexico, these spots were running way above normal as we kicked off the work week and really went through most of the work week. Now we're below normal. That front started to move to the east, and we've got uh, temperatures in the upper 50s in Shreveport running about 10 degrees below normal, 11 degrees below normal in Austin, 62 degrees. That's that's all you'll get for your high today, and that does start to spread to the east tomorrow. So cooler than normal temperatures for Atlanta to Charlotte with those highs into the upper 50s. Charleston will hit 62 degrees. As we get into early next week, we'll see kind of a gradual warning warming. Oh. So upper 40s, mid 40s for Sunday and Monday in New York, but we do get back to the 50s just barely. We go from the low 50s in D.C. to wrap up the weekend back into the upper 50s by the time we get into uh, Monday and Tuesday, guys. So still a lot of sunshine in the forecast. So even though it's going to be a little chilly, that autumn chill will be out there, but uh, you'll have plenty of, of, of sunshine to go around. So don't forget your sunglasses along with the snow <laughs> boots that you'll need for parts and, out into the north. And your umbrella. Of the US. And your umbrella <laughs> for the south. And I'm in that phase where I just am not bringing a coat because I'm like, we're not fully there. And then I'm like, it's 40 degrees. Yeah, yeah you haven't fully accepted that yeah. winter is. I guess so. I'm just like doing a vest away. or something. And it's like, this is not working. <laughs> your arms are like, <laughs> yeah. I need something yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks for the reminders. Of Angie, course. thank you. Well, coming up, one man breathing a sigh of relief after a life-saving transplant. We'll tell you the unique tool that played a critical role in keeping him alive. Plus, hot, hot heat. It's official. Last month was the hottest October on record. We're going to explain what's behind the rising temperatures and why this might just be the beginning. This is Morning News Now. We're back with a look at a creative and life-saving surgery that was, has a 34-year-old man in Chicago thanking his doctors. NBC News reporter Maya Eaglin shows us how breast implants played a crucial role in keeping him alive while he waited for a double lung transplant. A lot of stars align and clearly he was very lucky. Quick thinking doctors in Chicago came up with an innovative idea to use breast implants as temporary lungs in order to save Davy Bauer's life. Like millions of other Americans, Bauer picked up vaping for almost 10 years. It felt better and healthier, and so I just kind of stuck with it. And it is honestly more addicting than cigarettes, probably. But in April, his life took a dramatic turn when he contracted the flu. I felt a little short of breath was coughing up a lot of secretions. You know, we went to an urgent care center a little bit outside of St. Louis, and they're just like, he's got the flu and a little bit of pneumonia in his lungs. Here's a Z-Pack. And the next day he couldn't walk, and that's when I knew we need to get you to the ER. Bauer was taken to a hospital where his condition quickly worsened after developing a lung infection. And doctors told him his only chance of survival was to get a double lung transplant. 
So when we got a call from his hospital, we, we felt like maybe we could help help him. And um, it was very clear to me that he needed a double lung transplant, but it was also very clear that he would not survive that transplant. In order for doctors to perform the transplant, Bauer needed to get rid of his lung infection. Dr. Barat says upon arrival to Northwestern's hospital, Bauer went into cardiac arrest. We had to quickly come up with a strategy to maintain his normal blood flow in the body, uh, support his heart uh, using artificial devices. So Dr. Barat and his team came up with an out-of-the-box solution using artificial lungs and a pair of double D breast implants. One of our plastic surgeons was very uh, gracious to give me a rapid um, uh, fire course on what are the different types of breast implants, what are their shapes and all that. So we picked out uh, a couple of them that would, you know, they were more malleable and we could mold them to Davy's chest. Artificial lungs outside of his body allowed him to continue breathing and circulated blood to his heart. Within hours, Bauer's condition improved. Two days later, lungs from a donor replaced the breast implants and he was on the road to recovery. Vaping um, is, is normally touted as a safer alternative, but uh, just based on our knowledge and experience, that's not the case. I feel so blessed. I mean, it's incredible. I got a second chance at life. Maya Eaglin, NBC News. Well, the extreme heat we saw over the summer, you probably remember, it's not letting up. That's right. And European scientists say last month was the hottest October ever recorded. It is the fifth straight month that the Earth's temperature set such a record. And experts say this is a sign 2023 will go down as the hottest year ever. Oof. Kim Cobb is a professor and director at Brown University's Institute at Brown for Environment and Society joins us now with a closer look at this. Professor Cobb, thank you for joining us. I mean, this recent heating trend, is it surprising at all? And the fact that October was more than three degrees warmer than the average? Well, it's not surprising that we're having year-on-year -year global temperature records at this point almost every year. But what is surprising about this year is just how high those new records are coming in at. Um, shocking even for those of us who have been watching this unfold for decades of our careers in climate science. Um, but what's important to remember is that, of course, this will not stop here. Uh, 2024 already on our radar as a potential uh, record-breaking year, as 2023 is, of course, a lock for the new warmest year on record, beating out 2020, which is just a recent record set. But what's important to remember is to go beyond those statistics that have become like a drumbeat. We're almost immune to them. And to think about the cost on the ground uh, to human lives, livelihoods, our economy, um, public health, and national security. And that's really uh, where we have to recognize that we just can't become immune to the ongoing damages. And, and we do have to reach for any and all solutions to reduce emissions from fossil fuels and to accelerate our transition to a, a cleaner energy economy. Remind us some of the climate events that made this year so warm and also how many data points are looked at in order to establish a fact like the fact that we're discussing that there's a 93 percent chance that this is the hottest year on record. Yeah, so uh, instrumental records of temperatures go back oh, about 150 years. So we have a incredibly comprehensive uh, information to bring to bear on, on these statistics. And so when we hear that a uh, given months with three degrees warmer than preceding records, uh, that's really something that's going to leap off a chart that is very long indeed and captures a large range of uh, past natural variability, which is now, of course, uh, being completely overwhelmed by uh, man-made climate change caused by fossil fuel emissions. And so earlier this year, uh, we had a relatively cool uh, Pacific Ocean temperatures related to a La Nina event moving through to right now where we stand in an El Nino event, a vast warming of the largest ocean on our planet, uh, which comes every few years, obviously playing a major role in the uptick to 2023 being as warm as it is. But of course, earlier this year, it was cooler. So that's really something to remember. Uh, 2024, of course, will continue new El Nino conditions. We only have a few seconds left, Professor Cobb, but what does it mean if we just continue at this rate? Mm. 
Well, what we're seeing is, of course, escalating damages uh, with climate change causing upwards of $150 billion to our economy every single year. And these costs will continue as warming continues over the next decade or two. Critical few years here that we have to decide just how warm we're going to let it get over the next couple decades before we can turn to a pathway of global cooling later this century. Uh, we just simply must reach for all those levers to reduce fossil fuel emissions. All right. Professor Kim Cobb from Brown University, such an important conversation. Mm. Thank you for joining us this morning. Really I appreciate is. it. Thanks for having me. Coming up from the runways to 30,000 feet up, federal officials sounding the alarm about the safety of flying, the new warning and what you should know before you fly. We are back with a new warning from the head of the National Transportation Safety Board and the Air Traffic Controllers Union. We've all heard about these, these near misses in the air and on runways. They have hit a 10-year high, and they say the next one could end in disaster. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has the latest. From a recent mid-air collision involving two business jets after a pilot took off without clearance... To Austin. FedEx is on the go. Where a controller cleared a FedEx plane to land just as a Southwest flight was departing. Words fail to adequately describe how close 131 souls came to dying that day. To Boston, where a corporate jet crossed in front of a landing JetBlue flight. It's been a year of close calls. 23 runway near misses, more in the air. While just 1.3% of all flights, the NTSB chief warns the risk is growing. Our safety system is showing clear signs of strain that we cannot ignore. The biggest contributing factors, fatigue and distractions in cockpits and control towers. 77% of them understaffed, leading to mandatory six-day weeks and 10-hour days for controllers. While it'll take years to hire and train enough controllers, the CEO of Delta Airlines said on the Today Show the turnover is impacting safety. The air traffic controllers have had some, some new folks, so I think it warrants the continued review of our safety management. Are you concerned about the impact of that on safety of the airspace? Absolutely, I am worried about safety. Congress under pressure from all sides to spend the money for urgent safety upgrades. All right, thanks to Tom Costello for that report. Well, aside from calling for more air traffic controllers, aviation experts warn that only 43 airports have the automated systems that can issue urgent alerts if planes are on the wrong runway or headed for collision. They say more of those are desperately needed. Financial headlines now. The world's biggest bank was hit by a ransomware attack disrupting trades in the U.S. CNBC's Pippa Stevens is with us this morning with that and other money news. Hey, Pippa, good morning. Hey, Savannah. While well, a U.S. Union of China and the world's largest bank was hit by a ransomware attack that reportedly disrupted trading in the U.S. bond market this week. The Financial Services Division of ICBC handles trades and other services for financial institutions. The company, which is based in New York, says it's investigating the incident and has reported it to law enforcement. It says all Treasury trades made on Wednesday were eventually cleared. Reports say the attack was made by Lockbit, a Russian syndicate that has also targeted companies such as Boeing. Meantime, Verizon plans to offer Netflix and Max bundle at a discount. The Wall Street Journal reports the company will offer customers the ad-supported versions of the streaming services for $10 a month instead of $17. The bundle is expected to be announced in the coming weeks. It comes as more streaming platforms seek to work with telecom and tech companies as a way to hold on to viewers. And restaurants and retailers are offering deals for veterans and active duty military for Veterans Day. Denny's will give those with a valid military ID a free Grand Slam breakfast today from 5 a.m. to noon local time. Office Depot and Office Max will give a 25% discount to veterans, active and retired military, reservists and their dependents from Saturday to Monday. Duncan has given all active and retired military a free donut of their choice all day tomorrow. And Golden Corral will give active military and vets a free appreciation night dinner on Monday from 5 p.m. until closing. Savannah and Joe, back to you. All right. A trailer is dropped for the sequel to Disney and Pixar's Oscar-winning movie, Inside Out. Just like last time, the movie shows the emotions living inside a girl's head. But as she becomes a teen, they're joined by a new character, Anxiety is voiced by Maya Hawke. She joins Amy Poehler and Phyllis Smith, who return as joy and sadness. The original Inside Out was praised for helping kids understand their feelings, and Disney and Pixar are describing Inside Out 2 as a feel-everything movie 
You can watch it in theaters in June next year. Looking forward oh. to seeing that one. God, it's so like poignant just that, you know, as she becomes a teen, that emotion joins the mix, which is so much of what we talk about here. But so cool to see that portrayed in, in something like this, in animation. Sure. Thanks, Joe. Well, finally, this hour, a Michigan school radio station has been a mainstay in one small town since 1978. But when a larger station wanted to take over its radio frequency, the community stepped in to help save WOAS-FM. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has the details. When you live somewhere as remote as Michigan's Upper Peninsula, connection matters. You're listening to your sound choice, WOAS 88.5. This village of 1300 goes old school. Wow. You have Otis Redding, REM. Broadcasting from the Antonagon Area School Library since 1978. Run by retired teacher Ken Risenin, WOAS. This is the voice of Ontonagon Area Schools. and Help students Ontario. find their voice. Just have the freedom to play whatever you want. Public speaking, like, it, you use it every day. And every day, locals dial in. That broadcast signal is so limited, it fades about 15 miles outside this scenic village along Lake Superior. The strength of the signal is sort of the Achilles heel. Now, we're in what they call the unprotected part of the spectrum. At just 10 watts, its spot on the dial is always up for grabs by larger stations, like the one in nearby Marquette. In 2021, WOAS got a letter. WOAS will be required to change frequencies to come. This is where small towns soar. It provides a, a, a voice. It's local. We can lose radio in this town. The village raised $19,000, enough for a new 75-watt transmitter. This is like the little radio station that could. No, no. Keeping a connection from fading out. Maggie Vespa, NBC News, Antonagon, Michigan. Reminder how important radio is to so many people. Yeah, absolutely, and local news, even hyper-local in some exactly. cases. But so cool, the community was like, no, we want this still, stepping in to help. Exactly, all right. Awesome. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. Don't go anywhere, though. The news continues right now. And good news, it's Friday. Hey. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, pressing pause in the Middle East. The White House now reporting Israel will participate in daily rounds of four-hour breaks in fighting in parts of Gaza that will allow people there to move south. It comes as Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, clarifies the nation is not looking to occupy Gaza after the war. We're covering it all in just a moment. Also this morning, 2024 in view, with the pivotal Iowa caucus now on the horizon, the GOP frontrunners for the White House sounding off on the party's sluggish performance in Tuesday's elections, plus some eye-opening new poll numbers that have many Democrats sounding the alarm. And a stunning announcement from a key Democratic senator that could shake up the party's power in Washington come next year. Plus, Hollywood setting the stage for a big-time comeback. A key vote on that strike-ending deal between the actors and major studios is set for today. When could we finally see the return of some of our favorite content? We'll take a closer look. And later in the hour, we're hitting the drive through with some speedy post-pandemic fast food trends that have many of your favorite restaurants reimagining their business models. You know, have a car. Not a lot of drive throughs going on here. Yeah, in New York I know. City. that's true. We never really go to them here. <laughs> when we're like out on a shoot, and I am kind of like, yeah. yeah. Drive through. Yeah. All right. I got a rental car now. <laughs> totally All feel right. like More that. on that in a little bit. We're going to begin this hour with new developments in the war between Israel and Hamas. The White House says that Israel has agreed to daily four hour pauses in fighting to allow people in Gaza to flee. But Prime Minister Netanyahu continues to refuse calls for a ceasefire. He says that won't happen until the nearly 240 hostages are released. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons has the latest. Hey there, good day to you. The White House is as clear as the Israelis today. This is not a ceasefire, but it is calling it a significant step. And Secretary Blinken saying further steps are being discussed with the Israelis. 
All of this is so positive for the hostage families. But I've got to tell you, we're hearing very little from the Israelis about those pauses and the details of how exactly they're going to be implemented. This morning, no pause in Israel's war with Hamas. Overnight, Israel releasing new video of airstrikes. Filmed from a children's hospital this morning, Israeli tanks on the streets of Gaza City. Israel's Prime Minister telling Fox News there's no ceasefire. A ceasefire with Hamas means surrender to Hamas. This explosion was next to another hospital, Al Shifa, where Israel has said there's a Hamas headquarters. Hamas accused of using civilians as human shields, accusations denied by Hamas. The pictures there today show people killed, injured and terrified. Hundreds of thousands have been forced to flee from the north and Israel says the daily four-hour pause announced by the White House is a continuation of its humanitarian corridors. But for the families of Israeli hostages taken in the October 7th terror attacks where 1,400 were killed, any pause is hopeful. Yesterday, the group holding 77-year-old Hannah Katsia and a young boy, Yagil Yaakov, released a propaganda video of them, then promised to let them go. But there's no news this morning, and the International Committee of the Red Cross, which would facilitate any release, tells us it would need guarantees. Like we cannot force our way through the bullets. Yonatan Zygin believes his 74-year-old peace activist mom is held hostage too. First of all, bringing back the hostages, that's the first thing. We can't move on without it. There are multiple diplomatic meetings taking place right now behind closed doors. Two officials tell NBC News of a meeting yesterday in Qatar between the director of the CIA and the director of Israel's intelligence service. Again, many, many hurdles to come, but some positive news, some hope for those hostage families today. All right, Keir Simmons, thank you very much. Let's bring in Craig Mokhyber. He is a human rights lawyer who recently resigned as the director of the New York office of the U.N. High Commissioner of Human Rights over what he says is a failure by the U.N. to prevent the genocide of Palestinian civilians. Craig, thank you for joining us. So in your resignation letter, you describe the situation in Gaza as, quote, textbook genocide. Help us understand how you came to that conclusion. It's important to note the U.N. has not described it as a genocide. Why do you think the U.N. has been reluctant to do that? Well, the problem with the term genocide is that it's been very heavily politicized, often used in cases where it doesn't apply under the law and denied in cases where it doesn't. This is the latter case where we have a, an unusually clear case of genocide, not in political terms, in accordance with the definition in the UN Convention on Genocide that sets out specific intent and specific acts that taken together uh, include genocide. The acts are clear, you know, imposing conditions designed to bring about a destruction of normal life, um, mass killings, uh, uh, physical harms, and so on. But what's unusual in this case is the degree to which we have on the public record explicit uh, statements of intent, of genocidal intent. Normally, you have to dig through the archives and dusty secret documents to find evidence of intent. Here, you've had the president, the prime minister, senior government uh, ministers, senior military officials publicly and on the record declare what international law recognizes as genocidal intent. And when you have such a clear case, you can't simply say, well, it's for a court of law to decide later. Yes, it's for a court of law, but the convention includes an obligation of prevention. So you can't wait for a court verdict to start acting when you have these kinds of mass atrocities taking place. So there are many U.S. and Western politicians who argue Israel has the right to defend itself, that Hamas needs to be eliminated to prevent another attack like October 7th. So, so in your mind, then how do you get rid of Hamas and get the 200 plus hostages back? Well, first, we have to say that Israel as the occupying power in the Gaza Strip under international law as recognized universally as the occupying power has an obligation principally to protect the civilian population there. Secondly, when Israel engages in military activities, it has to do so in accordance with the requirements of international humanitarian law. And we've seen clear violations there. You cannot, just by saying you are pursuing Hamas or any other combatant, destroy wholesale schools and hospitals and churches and mosques and civilian infrastructure uh, and kill in just a matter of weeks 11,000 civilians. 
uh, wound many thousands more uh, and and erase entire families, generate multi generational families. So so claiming that you're involved in a conflict under international law does not give you permission to do whatever you want. You have to abide by international law. That's true of Hamas. That's true of Israel. And any perpetrators of war crimes have to be held accountable. Craig, there's been a lot of talk about what comes next once this is all over, including a renewed push here in the U.S. from Secretary Blinken and others for that two-state solution. What do you think should happen? Well, as I said in my letter, um, you know, having been involved in these conversations for many years, the idea of a two-state solution has become a kind of kind of an open joke in the corridors, in the diplomatic corridors, because everyone who follows it knows that it's impossible. There's nothing left for a Palestinian state. There's no hope that some Israeli government is suddenly going to uh, give back all of the West Bank and East Jerusalem and provide enough space for a sustainable Palestinian state. And secondly, that solution never dealt with the question of the human rights of Palestinians who would be permanently rendered as second-class citizens inside Israel. So, um, uh, so what I have said is we need to start applying to Israel and Palestine the same rules that we apply everywhere else in the world, which is to demand equality for Christians, Muslims, and Jews and a state that's based on human rights and the rule of law. We insist on that in other places. We need to start insisting on it here. We also need to deploy effective protection for all civilians. We need to make sure that Palestinians who have been purged have a right to return, as they do under international law. We need to account for the crimes of the past and hold perpetrators accountable and provide redress for victims. That's the, that's the hope for a peaceful solution. Returning to the status quo before October the 7th is just going to bring us more and more suffering, dispossession, persecution, and it will not bring peace. Craig Mokhyber, thank you for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Thank well, this week's it. election now behind us. All eyes are now looking ahead to the race for the White House in 2024, with the Iowa caucus now just over two months away. Well, this comes as West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin announced yesterday he won't seek re-election next year. Manchin is a pivotal vote for Democrats in the Senate and did not rule out running for another office. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig has the latest from Washington on all this. Hey, Garrett, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. We really are turning the corner now into that final sprint into the 2024 primary season. And as the Republican field gets smaller, the stakes are just getting bigger. And the party's frontrunner, Donald Trump, is showing new signs of strength against President Biden. This morning, after a major week in politics, the stakes raised for the 2024 election. Former President Trump weighing in overnight on the state of the race. It looks like we're number one in every poll. Reveling in his position as the overwhelming Republican frontrunner, which this week became even more clear, despite his rivals' attempts to gain traction in the Republican debate. Trump blasting one of them, Governor Ron DeSantis, in an interview with Univision. We're leading him by a lot, and we're leading Biden by a lot. But though recent polls do show Trump leading Biden in some swing states, it was a punishing week for Republicans, losing key seats even in red states, with Democratic voters energized over the issue of abortion. DeSantis blaming Trump for the GOP's poor showing. We have fewer governors than when he got elected president, fewer U.S. senators, fewer U.S. House members. But many GOP voters still believe it's Trump's nomination to lose. I think uh, Trump is the best candidate against Biden. Do you think he can be beaten? No. Democrats also have a new 2024 challenge, maintaining their majority in the Senate, with West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin announcing Thursday he won't seek re-election. What I will be doing is traveling the country and speaking out to see if there is an interest in creating a movement to mobilize the middle and bring Americans together. It's a major setback for Democrats and the president, as the senator is likely to be replaced by a Republican, which could tip the balance of a narrowly divided Senate in 2024. But President Biden staying positive with the growing likelihood of a 2020 rematch with Trump. Biden pushing back on recent polls that show him trailing Trump in key battleground states. Ten polls. Eight of them on Eight of them. You don't believe you're trailing in battleground states? No, I don't. Now, West Virginia is about as red of a state as it gets, and Manchin was facing a tough challenge from the state's popular Republican governor. With Manchin out, Republicans likely pick up one of the two Senate seats they would need to flip control of that chamber, and there's a big, wide-open map for them to pursue that second seat. Savannah. All right, Garrett, is there a chance, though, here that Manchin launches a third-party bid for the White House, as he's kind of teased before? And if he did, who would that benefit? Who would that hurt? 
Yeah, look, he's certainly been teasing that possibility. The question is, does he really want to try to go through with it, or does he want the attention from talking about it? It's always part of the mix with Manchin. I think the conventional wisdom is if he does decide to run, it would probably hurt the Biden campaign the most. The idea here being that any anti-Trump vote needs to either go to Biden or risk being kind of splintered off in a way that helps Donald Trump win. But there are a million different permutations for how that could go, Savannah, and right now Manchin's uh, ally say he's not taking anything off the table. Never a dull day in your job, Garrett Hake. Thank you very much. <laughs> Turning to other news, carjackings are on the rise across the country, and the FBI is taking notice. It's warning people to watch out for heart-stopping scenes like this one caught on camera in Illinois. A mom, dad, and their 12-year-old daughter carjacked at gunpoint in their own driveway. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us with more on that. Maggie, uh, what else can you tell us about this one? Well, I mean, Joe, first and foremost, you know, we use phrases like this a lot, but that video, and you're going to see it here, is truly jaw-dropping. To say this family is still in shock is a massive understatement. As you said, mom and daughter were actually just coming back from volleyball practice last week when they were carjacked in their own driveway. Authorities warning more and more everyone should be on alert for this type of threat. And that in mind, a warning. Some of the video you're about to see may be tough to watch. This morning, one family's nightmare serving as a warning to drivers everywhere. Last Thursday night, Michelle Pettiford and her 12-year-old daughter returned to their home in Chicago when surveillance cameras caught two armed men, one in a mask, sprinting toward them. I think it went through my head like, is this, is this real? Is this really happening? See them throw Michelle down, grab her purse, point their guns at her. At one point, one appearing to hit her. Her daughter ran into the house screaming. You hear about blood curdling screams. It's just something I'll never forget. Jeff Pettiford ran outside to help his wife. That's when he says one of the men put a gun to his head. Turns out they wanted one thing. I said, is where are the keys? Where are the keys? And she's screaming in my purse, in my purse. They weren't leaving without a car. No. Jeff pointed them to his Audi with the key fob already inside and the men drove off. Chicago police say the carjackers haven't been caught yet. The scene marking a stunning trend. New FBI data shows while most violent crime fell last year, carjackings were up 8% from the previous year, with nearly 90% of those carjackings involving a weapon. One fatal flashpoint in D.C., where investigators say an off-duty federal security officer last month shot and killed a 13-year-old who tried to carjack him. This just weeks after a Texas congressman was carjacked near the nation's capital. I looked to the left, somebody had a gun. Uh, to the right, somebody had a gun. <laughs> Back in Chicago, the Pettifords, stunned to learn the problem is so widespread, are afraid to go in their own backyard. You know, home isn't like that place of comfort and safety that it once was, which is really sad. Such a raw interview with that family. Uh, a quick update from Chicago police yesterday. So just a week after these carjackings, they say they actually found the Pettiford's car. They say there was a woman inside the car and they arrested her, they say, for misdemeanor trespassing. But of course, remember, there were two men inside that video and police say those carjackers haven't yet been caught. So in the meantime, authorities kind of issuing tips to help protect yourself from becoming a target of carjacking. Among them, they say lock your car doors, roll up your windows drive in the center lane because they say more and more people are being carjacked as they're driving like if they're at a light or something like that and then finally they say park in well-lit areas but of course remember this can happen anywhere guys as this story proves yeah mm -hmm. right. maggie thanks for bringing us that story we yeah. appreciate it wow all right now let's go to hollywood and that tentative deal that has been reached for actors today sag after his national board is set to vote on the agreement that brought an end to the longest strike in the union's history nbc news entertainment correspondent chloe malas has been following this from the beginning joins us with more chloe good morning good morning so we don't have the specific details of that deal but i know that so many are ready to get mm -hmm. back to work but it could be a long road before you see movie sets and film sets back in action with the stage set for Hollywood to get back to work new details have emerged about the tentative deal reached between SAG-AFTRA and the AMPTP which represents studios and streamers including NBC News's parent company Comcast
NBC News has learned from sources familiar with the contract, which will be voted on today by the union's national board, that it includes the largest minimum wage increase in 40 years, a new residual structure for streaming, and for the very first time, AI protections for members. The deal will also raise pension caps and include new guardrails around self-taped auditions. The union's president, Fran Drescher, called the proposal triumphant. It's the largest package in our industry history. Hollywood's biggest stars celebrating the end of the 118-day work stoppage. Viola Davis posting, congrats to all involved. And Kevin Bacon posting a footloose celebration of his own. With the longest actor's strike in Hollywood history over, the spotlight now on the mad scramble to get productions back up and running. A number of blockbuster films have already been pushed back. Dune 2, which was supposed to premiere last week, is now set to hit theaters in March. A Quiet Place Day 1 delayed from March of next year to June 2024. And Mission Impossible 8 has been bumped from June to May 2025. Meanwhile, TV's timeline for a return is sliding into next year. Cameras will probably start rolling as soon as early next week, but unlikely to see any new episodes much before January. If it's legal. It's ethical. Deadline reports Wolf Entertainment, the company behind hit franchises like Law and & Order and Chicago Fire, could start production soon after Thanksgiving, but only put out just 13 episodes. That abbreviated season likely to become the new norm for network shows looking to get back on track and back on the air. So, Chloe, let's pick up on that. Why is it taking some time? When will we see that come to an end? But it's kind of slow moving. I mean, first of all, it is a mad dash. These actors, if they had multiple projects in the works and then they had to shelve all of them, which one takes precedence? Also, these film sets, these TV show sets, these you don't just turn a switch on. There's right. crew <laughs> and cast and everybody that it takes. It takes a whole Hollywood village to get right. these uh, <laughs> shows and movies up and running. So it's going to take some time. You're going to see shorter TV seasons and you're going to see some of these films continue to get pushed into the next year. All right. All right. Well, we're ready for it. Chloe Malas, thank you so much. Thank you. An atmospheric river could bring some wet weather to the Northwest. Yeah, remember that term? Angie Lassman is back with us with the latest. Hey, Angie. Hey, good morning, guys. You're exactly right. We've got some rain on tap for parts of the Pacific Northwest, not just today and not even just through the weekend, but even into early next week, we could see our first atmospheric river really of the season uh, develop and just provide ample amounts of moisture to folks out west. So let's talk about what we're dealing with today. It'll be unsettled across the Northwest. We've got this this next Pacific storm that's working uh, its way onshore. We could see not just the heavy rain associated with this and of course the snow, but also some of those elevated winds. That'll be something that lasts with us into tomorrow, uh, especially when it comes to the slick travel. Notice I am noting I-90 and I-84 could be slick, so take it slow on those roads if you're going to be out and about in those areas here for Saturday. Now, looking at your rainfall forecast as we get through Sunday, uh, spots forks is, are going to be seeing anywhere from three to four inches. Those are the higher amounts that we'll see, maybe an inch or two uh, possible elsewhere, and about a quarter of an inch for a more widespread area. Now, let's talk about that developing atmospheric river. So Monday through Wednesday of next week, we're going to start to see that being delivered to California. So what that means is we got, we've got this moisture plume that stretches really from California all the way out to Hawaii. It's going to deliver that moisture right along into the coast. So we see heavy rain and we see mountain snow from that because of this orographic lift, or basically as uh, warm air moves up along the mountain, it gains elevation and it cools and it just kind of squeezes out all of that available moisture that we have. So we're going to see that uh, Im impact folks there with rain and snow. And this will be something that we'll have to watch through next week uh, as we uh, gear up for a uh, winter season. And That's snow, right. of course, is, is uh, people love it when it comes to the skis and snow resorts. Guys, it'll be great. I totally agree. And I really hope we get snow in New York this year. Me which too. We have Fingers not crossed. really seen, which is a whole other conversation. All right, Angela Lassman, thank you so much. Great. Coming up on this hour of Morning News Now, the on-the-go dining trends that are quickly morphing America's fast food industry in a post-pandemic world. But first, a costly courtroom verdict for actor Robert De Niro and his production company, why a New York jury is now ordering it to shell out over a million dollars to a former employee. That is up next. Stick around.
We're back with a surprise inspection at a federal women's prison in Florida that revealed terrible conditions. That's according to a report issued Wednesday by the Justice Department's internal watchdog. NBC's Ken Delanian spoke exclusively with a Justice Department investigator about what they found. Moldy bread, rotten cucumbers, rat droppings. When Justice Department investigators showed up for a surprise inspection of a federal women's prison in Tallahassee, they were horrified. What we found was stunning. We saw inmates being served in their regular meal, bread that had mold on it. We saw evidence of rodent droppings. We saw bugs crawling on cereals. We saw warped food containers, food in there that should never be served to anybody. Well, the unannounced inspections... Michael Horowitz, the DOJ's inspector general, spoke to us exclusively about the report and about his frustration over the failings of America's federal prison system. What we saw in the facility was not in any way conditions that anybody should live in. We saw a shower with pooled water that was black. We saw black spots on walls, which looked to be consistent with mold. It's not an isolated incident. Horowitz told us he's been documenting bad management and awful conditions at the nation's 122 federal prisons for more than a decade, and not much has changed. These didn't happen overnight. This isn't a new problem. I've been here 11 years as IG. Uh, the current BOP director is my eighth director that I've dealt with during that time. Horowitz investigated the suicide of accused rapist Jeffrey Epstein and the murder of mob boss Whitey Bulger, two high-profile deaths inside federal prisons. He found that both were linked to massive failures by the Federal Bureau of Prisons, which is part of the Justice Department. There's a lot of things that need to occur. Last year, a Senate investigation found rampant sexual abuse of female prisoners by male prison guards. It's been very concerning and frustrating to my staff. Our reviews keep finding the same problems over and over again. The BOP said in a statement that it will carefully evaluate and implement any necessary corrective actions to ensure that our mission of operating safe, secure, and humane facilities continues to be fulfilled. Horowitz credited current Justice Department leadership and the new Bureau of Prisons director with trying to fix the problem, one that affects about 150,000 inmates. But, he said, it will take years. BOP Director Colette Peters making the case to Congress for more money. Our officers do not get paid enough. Um, we have trouble keeping them. State corrections will offer uh, higher salaries than what we pay. Um, even local sheriffs are able to pay more than what we're able to pay in certain regions. Some people watching this are going to be saying to themselves, look, this is prison. It's not supposed to be the Ritz-Carlton. What's the big deal here? So the issue with this is um, we need to have humane conditions for people in prison. been said by many people, including, I think, by Nelson Mandela famously, that you can judge a society by how you treat your inmates. And looking at this, this is no way to treat inmates. This is a basic human rights issue. Our thanks to Ken Delanian for that report. Let's get to international headlines now. In Spain, a right-wing politician is in the hospital after being shot in broad daylight. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter has the details on that and other news around the world. Hey, Molly, good morning. Savannah, good morning to you. That's right. We are starting in Spain, a rare shooting in the Spanish capital Thursday. Right-wing politician Alejandro Vidal Cuadras was shot in broad daylight in central Madrid. A police source says they're tracking all leads, including the lawmaker's possible link with the Iranian opposition. Moving to Iceland, thousands of minor earthquakes have raised fears in Iceland of a possible volcanic eruption. Over 20,000 tremors have been detected by the Icelandic Met Office since late October. And get this, 1,400 in a 24-hour period this week. This heightened activity led to the famed Blue Lagoon being closed as a precaution. It will be closed until November 16th. And finally, yes, actors are back to work and back on the red carpet. The cast of the fifth installment of Hunger Games hit the red carpet in the world premiere last night. It was a dazzling affair. They'd actually been given a waiver to attend the premiere if the strike was ongoing. But as we know, the SAG after strike ended and the stars were asked about it last night. Josh Andres Rivera saying, I know a lot of people who are ready to get back to work. I'm ready to get back to work. I know you guys, Savannah and Joe, are excited about the end of the strike, too. Hollywood is back and the Hunger Games, the best. Ballad of Songbird and Snakes hits theaters in the UK and in the US next week. I cannot wait to see that. I was a major so fan excited. of the original series. I read that book. So fantastic. And it's so fun to see Red Carpet back. Molly, thanks so much.
Well, the legal battle between Robert De Niro and his longtime assistant, Graham Chase Robinson, has come to an end for now. A New York jury found De Niro's production company liable for gender discrimination against Robinson during her tenure. tenure. Canal Productions must now pay her more than $1.2 million in damages. Here's NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk. Graham Chase Robinson was De Niro's go-to person for over a decade, first as a personal assistant and later as VP of production and finance at his company. As the years went by, she claims the lines between personal and professional grew blurred, while the 80-year-old Oscar winner described her allegations as nonsense. How'd it go in there today? After nine days of testimony inside a New York courtroom, legendary movie star Robert De Niro... You talking to me? in the spotlight off screen. A jury finding his company Canal Productions liable for gender discrimination and retaliation on Thursday, ordering it to pay $1.2 million in damages to his former longtime assistant. Graham Chase Robinson had worked for the Hollywood star since 2008. De Niro, who was also a defendant in the case, was not found personally at fault by the jury. De Niro's attorney calling the verdict a great victory for Mr. De Niro. He is absolved. He is not liable for anything that was charged against him at all. But Chase Robinson's lawyer says that's just legal semantics. To get a, a verdict against Canal Productions is functionally equivalent to getting a verdict against Robert De Niro. Robinson spent 11 years working for De Niro before quitting in 2019. Following the split, De Niro and his company filed a $6 million lawsuit against Robinson, claiming she abused her position and inappropriately used her employer's fund for her personal gain, including 5 million of De Niro's frequent flyer miles. Robinson filed a $12 million countersuit, claiming De Niro assigned her stereotypical female job duties inconsistent with her job title, subjected her to sexist comments and conduct, and paid her less than a male employee based on stereotypes. During his testimony, De Niro denied any wrongdoing and dismissed Robinson's allegations as nonsense. According to the court transcripts, the Oscar winner shouted, shame on you, Chase Robinson, from the witness stand when asked if he ever suggested Robinson scratch his back. De Niro admitting he might have called her petulant and a spoiled brat during her employment. I think for the first time in four years, she can breathe and she can move on with her life. As for De Niro and Canal's lawsuit against Robinson, a jury did not find her guilty on any of those claims. NBC News reached out to De Niro's attorney for comment, but there's been no response. Back to you. All right, Stephanie Goss, thank you so much. Coming up, we've got some alarming new data from the CDC on just how many kids are getting their routine vaccinations, why we're now seeing rates at historic lows, and what you and your family should know as we head into the holidays. Stick around. It's up next. Welcome back. Well, we already knew that during the pandemic, there was a drop in children receiving vaccinations. Now, new data from the CDC shows that the number of kindergartners getting those routine childhood vaccinations still has not returned to pre-pandemic levels. Data also shows that exemptions from school vaccination requirements jumped to 3% during last school year. That's the highest level ever seen, actually. Dr. Bio curry Rinchel joins us now for a closer look at these numbers. She's a physician and a health equity advocate and friend of the show as well. Doctor, always great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. So let's dig in first. I just want to read some of these statistics. So last school year, it was about 93% of children in kindergarten that met the vaccination requirements. That is lower than the 95% seen in 2019 to 2020 before the pandemic. 40 states also saw rises in parents citing religious or other personal concerns for not vaccinating their young children. I have to say, doctor, after there was so much confusion and kind of a lot of contention around the vaccine during COVID and around the rollout and a lot of misinformation, I guess I'm not that surprised, but I'm just wondering, especially since we're talking about those routine vaccinations as a medical professional, does this data surprise you? It does not surprise me. We know based on the history of so much divide when we talk about vaccinations that this was likely to happen and it's continued to happen, unfortunately, which has now really affected the disease rates that were really non-existent before. And now we're seeing pops up, pop up of diseases that we've never seen before. Let's talk, though, about the concern around the fact that, like I mentioned, this is just kids going into kindergarten getting those vaccines generally. We're not just talking about the COVID vaccines. Do you, why is it that you think we're seeing such a significant drop in vaccination rates when it comes to those types of shots? 
Well, you know, a lot of parents and caregivers are just really feeling a mistrust with the flu vaccine, even standard vaccinations that were a part of a child's, you know, wellness check. And so unfortunately, that mistrust is now leading to our kiddos not getting vaccinated as they did before. And so we really have to look at what can we do to combat this? Because we even saw years before where we were seeing polio, other diseases that were eradicated now are back. What's the solution here? What do you think? How can medical professionals help put patients at ease and rebuild their trust in vaccines, knowing that a lot of people have valid concerns and confusion over what's happened over the last few years? Well, I think it's important that we invest in really listening to our patients. For me, I ask my patients, you know, and the parents, what is it that's stopping you from vaccinating your child? And so I think if we as a whole can lean into that and find out where that mistrust lies, it allows us to provide credibility and really combat that mistrust. So as a whole, we've got to listen and then we've got to respond and provide credible information. And doctor, give us some tips as we head into the holidays. First of all, of course, it's colder. A lot of people get sick anyway. And then we're gathering with so many people because we're celebrating and we're doing so indoors. Walk us through some reminders here because we have, you know, heard about the flu shot. We know about this new COVID booster. Should people be getting that? What should people know as we head into these next few months? So it's important to still get vaccinated. However, you know, when you are feeling ill, any symptoms, it's important to have tests with you. And so if you're traveling or if you're at home, we now know that tests are available. So that's important. Also, if you're going to be out of state, look for your local urgent care or facility just in case. And I think the biggest thing we can all do for our family and our loved ones so we can celebrate is if you're not feeling well, Get, go ahead and seek out help. That's important. You know, get tested so you don't um, accidentally infect somebody else. Mm. Important reminders here now that we've been in this for a while. Dr. Bio and Chokari, yes. thank you very much for joining us. Well, the Veterans Response Team is a unit dedicated to helping America's veterans in crisis. The goal is to connect them with police officers who also served with former military members and who are experiencing their own mental health struggles. Lucy Bustamante from our affiliate station in Philadelphia takes a closer look at how the new program could help save lives. Fallujah, May of 2007. Marine veteran Matthew Godomsky barely survives a roadside bomb. I was staying a traumatic brain injury that we didn't know for years. He needed his family, but connecting with them felt impossible. They don't get what you just went through. Some of the questions were always odd. You know, how many people you killed? That's not really what we want to talk about. It's who didn't come home. Matt's family watched his depression spiral. Every one of my brothers were just waiting for a phone call saying I was dead. In 2016, during a drinking binge, his mom reached out for help. And to his surprise, a fellow Marine from his own unit answered the call. Newcastle County, Delaware officer Nick Hurst. He recognized that, and that's when the interaction really started. You thought that your wife was coaching the responding officer. I really thought my wife guided Nick say that he was a Marine, that he was from 2-6, that he was a machine gunner. And I'm like, I don't know this guy. Nick kept answering his questions. And when he named the friend they both had lost. It was almost like a light bulb clicked on that I wasn't just some random cop showing up in his front yard. Matt let Officer Hurst secure a nearby gun. That gun that was sitting on that workbench would have probably been grabbed. That was the moment that Officer yeah. Hurst knew he had to propose a veterans response team, a unit where officers who also served would respond to veterans in crisis. He brought the idea to the Wilmington VA police chief, who set up the training with the crisis intervention unit and the Homeless and Justice Outreach Center. You're bringing a military veteran who's a law enforcement officer so that they can connect on the same level as a veteran in crisis. Cecilia Gonzalez runs it. She says addressing their smaller issues often prevents the major crises. The VRT officers came and mowed his lawn. I mean, you know, little so, things like that. Little things. To show we see you. Right. We see that you're struggling a little bit, and it may not be a crisis, so to speak, but it's 
a crisis to you. Since 2017, officers from 41 different departments have attended this training. And this month, it expands to every VA regional office in the country. Atlantic County, New Jersey, just started their VRT training. Marine veteran Detective Chris Southard heard of the program. We work very close with the local counselors. So if we encounter a vet who's in need of some sort of resource, we can contact a counselor directly and they will help solve the problem. The following video is how they say it should work. This is back in 2018 when a Colorado police officer responds to the call of a suicidal man. The officer realizes that he has served. Listen to the language he uses. Dude, don't do it to another vet. Don't do it to me. Drop the weapon. After 11 long minutes. But I want to help you, man, because I'm tired of losing brothers and sisters. The psychology of shared veteran trauma kicks in. <laughs> Matt remembers that shift well. I mean, if it wasn't for you, Nick, to be honest here, I wouldn't be a father to my kids. A connection that one divine day saved Matt's life. Who knew that it would be Matt that would be the first person that I did it for? Our thanks to Lucy Bustamante for that report, so important. And if you or anyone you know is struggling, please call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. Well, there is still much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now. After the break, the fast food trends that America has picked over the pandemic, picked up, excuse me, over the pandemic, that have places with drive-through service reimagining the way they do business. Plus, with the holidays just around the corner, Joe's heading between the branches, if you will, with a closer look at this year's, <laughs> he's not going into the tree, just so you know, but a closer look at this year's Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. Those stories and more up next. Welcome back. The COVID pandemic changed many parts of our society, including the way we work, but also how we order food. One dining trend that continues to thrive post-pandemic is drive-through service. They have seen a sales boom. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins us now from North Miami Beach with more on this. Of course, he's at a drive-through. I'm surprised you're not in a car for us, Sam, but good morning. I was. You know, we're just <laughs> rotating through different options. Savannah, good morning. And obviously, many people are going to associate drive throughs with this, what you're seeing behind me. Cars in the morning, people getting their caffeine fixed. Savannah, you mentioned the pandemic. It really did arrive, or I should say derive from this idea of safety and convenience as people were worried about that. Now meeting technology and just the power and the brilliance of being able to go through here. I have my Dunkin' app, order, you know, right now just a midnight coffee and pick it up minutes later. It has worked out so nicely, so beautifully that people have decided that they want to really crave okay. food now on their own terms. And that is this driving a jump right now in drive throughs These days, it's hold the fries and the human contact. Post pandemic, customers have been flocking to drive throughs like never before. It's good to order, pick it up, keep it moving. New research shows overall dine-in traffic is down almost 50% compared to 2019, while drive through service has become the meat of the business, generating around two-thirds of all revenues for quick service restaurants. Sometimes you really don't want to leave your house, one, but to be able to leave your house and not get out the car helps. As Americans increasingly choose to grab and go, often with a quick click on their phone, companies are responding with app-based ordering systems, no contact pickups, and some are even closing dining rooms completely. At Chipotle, where part of the appeal used to be seeing your order put together right in front of you. This is where everything is going. Forward. Michael Rojas says the majority of the seven restaurants he oversees in Miami get the bulk of their sales through Chipotle's, where drivers order ahead online or via the app and never leave their car. Are you seeing a larger percentage of people that are utilizing the digital? Absolutely. Operation? It went from anywhere between 10 to 12 percent and has gone up to 60 percent in some of my locations. And they're not alone. The whole industry is reimagining its business model. Chick-fil-A announcing a new location in Atlanta with an elevated kitchen and four car lanes underneath for digital and drive through orders. And for a truly futuristic window, check out the Taco Bell Defy in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota where at several drive through windows, the food goes not south of the border, but south of a vertical tube after you scan your QR code. And one of America's most iconic coffee options, Dunkin', brewing up new options. Telling NBC News, drive through traffic skyrocketed during the pandemic and remains high. 
So they've changed to meet guests on their terms with innovations like order ahead, loyalty programs, digital menu boards, and drive through only restaurants to personalize their visit. Basically, what we're seeing is that drive throughs are getting faster and people are relying on them more because they don't want to dine inside anymore. On social media, drive through love is real. If there isn't a drive through line, I'm not I'm not doing it. Still, even in 2023, you'll find some people craving what's now become a rarity, real human interaction. You don't really appreciate a person until you see them. So tell us, what can we expect in the future? Is this going to hold up? What I thought, I definitely it's going to hold up, Savannah. What I thought was so interesting is whether it is Chick-fil-A, Chipotle, or Dunkin'. So many of these companies right now have shifted the paradigm of what they're planning for the future, which is to say they have new businesses opening up, as we talked about, that are almost entirely no dining options, all drive through, all digital, which is not to say that's going to expand to the entire sector by any means. But this now, the drive through and using your phone is going to be the norm. And that we expect to be the case moving forward. So drink up to that, my friends. Sam, you. You, are you Chipotle, Chick-fil-A? What is it? Chipotle, uh, that, well, first of Same. all, like you can't go wrong, right? I like all of those options. But yes, Chipotle, burrito bowl, barbacoa, as much guac as you can possibly get in there. That's for me. Well, <laughs> Thank you, you for not to. only confirming your <laughs> location of choice, but your order. So now I know how to make you happy. Sam Brock, thank you no very problem. much. <laughs> all right, well, if it's Friday, you know we've got the latest installment of our Can't Miss list on deck for you. It's a rundown of all the must-see content for your weekend. Today, the Marvel Cinematic Universe gets a little bigger with the release of the Marvels. We've got a preview that and more up next. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas around here. Cue the tie I'm wearing. At least that's what we're going to be seeing tomorrow when the Rockefeller Center tree pulls into Manhattan in the 30 Rock. The Norway spruce once again coming from upstate New York and we had a chance to meet the special family donating the tree a gift they hope is a symbol of the holiday spirit. When Matt and Jackie McGinley moved into their Vestal, New York home in 2019, they paid little attention to the giant tree towering over their driveway. We had a whole punch list of things that needed to get repaired, things that we wanted to update or remodel, and frankly, the tree was just kind of in the background. But someone else did take notice, Rockefeller Center's head gardener, Eric Pauze. In pulls a car, a uh, guy gets out. My name is Like, understand how crazy you sound right now. They couldn't have known Pase is a Rockefeller Christmas tree legend, having personally discovered each tree for the last 30 years. I Googled him and realized, and I quickly texted him out, this is legitimate. We thought they were dating a lot of other trees, that maybe ours would be considered. And then as the date got closer and closer, we realized that, in fact, we probably did have the Rockefeller Center tree. The Beginleys knew they wanted to be part of this special tradition, donating the tree they hope it brings joy during a busy and sometimes emotional season. This is not about us, but it's about being of service to other people, giving them that chance to go and make memories by the tree. And for those like us who've had loss, to go back to that space and remember the people that they love. The McGinleys will be remembering Matt's mother, who passed away four years ago. I think she would think it was the coolest thing. Like I keep having this feeling of like, who am I not telling about this? There's somebody that, that I should be, that I feel like I ought to tell, and it's her, you know. Um, I was able to reach out to her best friend, and that person will be with us on the day of the cutting. The McGinley's two kids will be at the tree cutting too. Zoe, age 12, and Charlie, age 9, admit the hardest part of the whole process was keeping their tree's star status hidden until the official reveal. <laughs> I'm really bad at secrets, but I've been able to keep this one. <laughs> the tree stands 80 feet tall. It will arrive in this very spot this weekend with a full police escort, and it will become a part of New York history with 50,000 LED lights making it shine bright as a symbol of the holiday season. Three, two, one. The deeply 
deeply rooted tradition of the Rockefeller tree goes all the way back to 1931 when a Christmas tree was put up by the construction workers building Rock Center. Today, more than 100 million people visit the plaza each year to see the world famous tree. McGinley's say they're proud that tree from their own yard is playing a special role. Matt's mom used to always emphasize joy, and so that idea of joy in that space is really exciting. Eek. And I think the McGinley Street is most definitely going to bring a lot of joy to people from all over the world. As we mentioned, it's set to arrive here tomorrow morning. Then the decorating starts with that Swarovski star covered in three million crystals then sitting at the top, the ah. official lighting, then, of course, the week after. Thanksgiving. I can't wait. And Joe and I are lucky enough to kind of get to see it through our it's, office. Yeah, we, when we look through our window, through we can like see a it a lit. Yeah, a window, little bit. But it's there. Exactly. All right. Ah, it's Christmas time. Time to grab your popcorn, make some room on the couch. Even if you're at work, it's time for the return <laughs> of our weekly Can't Miss List. That's right. And sweet, sweet Brian Balthazar, <laughs> who just commented during that, they're very good people. They are good people. <laughs> <laughs> they are. I mean, it's really sweet. It's so, it is so sweet. It and so how do they store the that. lights? How do you store 50,000 lights? That's the <laughs> yeah, story. Imagine I untangling them, well. them every year. If there's a hack oh. to that, I want to know yeah. about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like we do so many questions on the tree, but there really are still always like right. so many yeah, questions. Right. On. And Absolutely that one more. like sketchy one where it definitely got like extension. Yeah, help. there was. Oh, yeah. They always this get a little. Full, yeah. so that's Charlie right. Brown tree. They get the full L.A. treatment. She looks ready to go. All right. Brian, good morning. Thank you for chatting about the tree with us as well as being here for Camp Miss List. Happy to. Let's first talk about the Marvels. Right. Big deal, right? Especially the studios had, you know, some uh, interesting reception on some things in the right. past recently. Yes, so the Marvel, the, the latest Marvel movie is called The Marvels, and it's about a trio of heroines, one of them being uh, Captain Marvel Brie Larson, where they get their powers intertangled, inter intermeshed, and they have to figure out how to how to manage that. And of course, the universe is in jeopardy. The stress levels in the Marvel universe must be very high, because the universe is frequently in jeopardy. I've, so I've true. high faith. What did they mean when they were it wasn't? So right, yeah. Like, around. Yeah, we're just going like, to hang out. It's like, like a when they really book. focus on the people who live there, they're like, what's the matter with right. our world? Yeah, so there's some space-time continuum, continuum issues, but I'm confident they will resolve, <laughs> it, resolve it. And and there has been a bit of a polarizing response, okay. mixed. Right. But I think it's worth checking out. Don't you want to go see a big movie? Or yeah. see one, do you want to get emotional and have a good cry? Yeah. And not be watching the news. See a movie that's emotional. Yeah. Um, this is Paul Giamatti in oh. a movie called The Holdovers, which is set in 1970. Oh. And stylistically, even in the trailer it looks so very cool 1970s it? and he plays a prep school teacher and the holdovers are the students who don't have anywhere to go during the holidays so they're kind of uh you know sometimes they're troubled including one child uh a kid um, paul giamatti then cue the emotional journey for everyone because paul giamatti is a bit of a curmudgeon he's a cranky one yeah yeah and the kid has some stuff happening at home yeah. and it's emotional but it's also very funny and it's you know you don't see movies like this anymore because oh. this is studios want to like make blockbusters but this is an emotional This is like right. the behind the sideways, too. Or sideways, right? Yeah, yeah. Body was in that yeah. and saving people. Exactly. Scene, so, so there's that pairing. Those, and I think yeah. we'll see some Academy uh, recognition for this. It's so That type of storyline, just so emotional. Always gets me. Let's talk about what you can watch at home. Something streaming, highly anticipated film, The Killer. That's right. Okay, we have David Fincher, the director, who also brought us Seven. I don't know if you remember movie Seven no, with Morgan yeah. Freeman and Brad Pitt. Okay, okay, so this uh, stars Michael Fassbender <laughs> as an Not assassin. Kind of movie. <laughs> <laughs> He's an assassin who's you had a perfect score up until recently he kind of botches an attempt hmm. so now he is dealing with his employers and it all kind of unravels but it's also part action part psychological thriller because okay. you're inside his head uh as just as seven was it's a little bit messes with your head a little bit all right we have just under a minute Ooh, here so we've that. got an uncomfortable comedy series and the return of a fan favorite sci-fi show right? okay you got to watch the curse i have to say all right. this is on paramount plus and showtime and it stars emma stone uh and nathan fielder as a couple who hosts an ancient tv show it's close to home I've executive produced this kind of show. But they, they do they or don't they have a, a curse placed on them? And it's funny, it's dramatic. Is it real? Is it not? But this looks really funny. This is a series. And then for all they, mankind. They're doing an HGTV show and they might be cursed. They might be cursed, really but okay. they do a charitable act. And then it's a good story. You have to watch the trailer and I think you'll immediately be into it. <laughs> yeah. And sci fi. Okay, sci-fi, we have For All Mankind on Apple TV+. Plus. It's oh, season yeah. four, set in 19, uh, 2003. Every season has been set in a different year. It's if the Russians got to land on the moon before we did and all the things oh. that happened. And wow. explore. All right, go seek it go out. See it. There right. we go. Brian. Perfect timing there, Brian. Thank, Thank you. Happy you Friday. So much. Happy Thank watching. You. Merry Christmas. We can do it to this hour of morning news now. <laughs> the news continues right now. Stay with us. Where are we? 
Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.